Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Mark chapter 12 is a chapter of the scriptures that includes three testing questions in which Christ was tested by his enemies. First of all, the question of paying taxes to Caesar came up. Then, the question of marriage at the resurrection by the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. And now we have a third question. And I say it comes from his enemies because even though this particular individual who comes to raise the question might not in the end be an enemy of Christ, yet he was sent by the Pharisees, as we're told by Matthew. So let's read then from verse 28 of Mark 12 about this third question. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but Him. To love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that He had answered wisely, He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. From then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. I think it will be helpful this evening if we look at this uh, text in this way. First of all, paying some attention to this man. There is something going on here that causes us not to just quickly pass over him as we might have done with the Pharisees and the Sadducees on other occasions, just noticing who it was. So we'll spend a little bit of time and attention on him. And then we will look at his question and Christ's answer. So those three main areas. First of all then, this man, coming from the Pharisees, sent from them as he was, and raising this question. Of course he came from a context where this was a very much uh, debated matter at the time. The uh, question of the laws was a hot and a burning issue in the time. The rabbis of the day had identified 613 different laws. Uh, and of course they were very careful in their um, studying of them and their weighing them all up. And there had been all sorts of de debate among themselves, and some of them didn't have a clue. Uh, some of them, we're told, uh, valued the commands, the commandments, in this way. They allocated a number to every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and then they added all the letters of the alphabet up that were in that command, and if the number was the biggest, that was the most important commandment. That was actually how some of the... Uh, the weighing up went. Uh, it was not all so foolish and, and arbitrary uh, as that. Um, but there certainly was a lot of questioning. Uh, and the question is raised, of course, to test the Lord Jesus. And it is a, a, a testing question. And we'll, we'll leave for the moment the man. We'll come back to him again just a little bit later on. Let's look then at the question. Of all the 
commandments, which is the most important? Okay. Now, is this a good question? Is it really a good question? Or is it a question that we shouldn't even think about? Some people would tell you that really it's, you know, it's not worth bothering about. Uh, evangelicals today would tell you that, some of them. They would say to you, one sin is as another. One sin is enough to send you to hell, right? So, what's the difference? If you've broken the law, you've broken all of the law. You see, and that's true. But it's not the whole truth. And uh, on the question of Christian ethics and God's holy law, which is all over the scriptures, this is a very serious matter. We must ponder carefully on the laws and teachings of God. We must meditate on them day and night. We must love them. We must understand them. We must not simply sweep aside the keeping of God's law. As some well-intentioned modern day preachers will tell you. Right? It makes no real difference at the end of the day if you tell a little white lie in a situation to spare somebody's feelings or if you are a mass murderer. Because sin is sin. And similarly, they flip the coin and they say, well, Christ has died for sins. And so, because he has kept the law and he has forgiven you all of your sins and paid the price, Christ has done it all and you don't need to bother about this sort of a question. You don't need to fuss too much about sin or about the keeping of God's law. But we need to take note that the scripture nowhere speaks negatively about keeping God's law. Nowhere. And the church of God today fails to understand that. And in this particular passage in front of us, Christ does not dismiss the law of God. He does not dismiss the question. But he speaks with the utmost regard for the law of God and which of them is the most important. It's a legitimate question. Notice also concerning the question that the question asks for just one answer, one commandment. Which of them? Uh, it's not asking for the Lord to list more than one. You follow that. But he actually does. He, he speaks of two commandments, the first and the second. But Take note that he, he is really still answering just the one question, and he really is giving one answer with two parts to it. All right? Do you see that? Uh, and that's because the two are, are so closely connected. And uh, you cannot have uh, the one without the other. But furthermore, Christ, when he finishes his answer, he says, there is no commandment greater than these. Okay, so I think that's the best way to understand Christ's response is not so much to be giving, to be going above and beyond the question, giving first one, uh, first, the first and the second commandment, but rather see them as, as closely united. Not more of that will come out in a moment. It's come to the most important thing, the answer. Let me tell you a story, a true story. There was a time when a bunch of people from the English Reformed Church went hiking. And they went up the mountainside, and the mountainside started like this. Okay? And so when they set out on their hike, they thought, this is going to be easy. <laughs> All right, and their uh, their uh, enthusiastic leader said, "We can go the long way up this mountain because we got plenty of time. This part went quickly, and in kilometres we're almost a third of the way. We'll be there by lunchtime." Well, we took the long road at a bad decision, and we ended up. Uh, with the sun setting on us, and we were in a thick forest. Up on the mountainside, 
I can't remember if it had started raining at that point or whether the rain came a little bit later, but we were in the darkness on a single path through the forest. And uh, the party was a little bit strung out, but not too much. Uh, but enough for there to be a little bit of a gap between the front and the back people. And the pathway crossed a dry riverbed, which in the darkness looks like a split in the pathway. So some, some of the party carried on on the pathway, and the other half of the party went up the dry riverbed, which got steeper and steeper and steeper and ended up nowhere. In the pitch darkness, and then the rain came. And they didn't know where they were, and had the good sense, like hikers should have, if you're lost, stay put, at least for a while. Maybe you'll be found. Uh, and if you don't know where you're going, you could get even more lost in the thick darkness. So, to cut a long story short, they decided to stay the night in the forest. This, you might think, is scary and unpleasant. But our daughter, Tammy, who was part of that party, tells us that that was one of the most wonderful and memorable nights of her life. Because the fireflies in the forest were entrancing the sounds, the silence, the rustling of the leaves, the falling of the rain, the feeling of the dampness and yet the warmth of your sleeping bag, and uh, the sense of vulnerability, and yet also security in numbers, um, and uh, things that your eyes could pick up in the darkness, uh, and all of that, the smell of the forest and the wetness, uh, everything was... And she's an artist, you see, so she kind of has a sense of these things that us mere mortals uh, don't quite achieve. Um, but I think she was alive that night, right? All of her senses, all of her nerve endings, uh, she was alive. And then uh, you might think also of the song, Annie's song. Right? You fill up my senses like a night in the forest. I'm going to make one more connection. When I was reading the best Bible teacher, I think, since the Apostles, and he was explaining this passage of Scripture, he said, Christ's answer means that we must fill up our senses with the love of God. Now, I don't know if John Denver had read Kelvin, but uh, <laughs> I think both of them were on to something. Um, the Lord has made us in this wonderful way. He's given us these senses. He's made us the people that we are with all of our capabilities. And it was with everything that we are that we must love God. Way more than a night in the forest. And I think that when you begin to think of it in these terms, you begin to understand the Lord's answer. His answer comes instantly and with authority. There's no debate about it, and that's the way with Christ. He doesn't put things up for discussion and pondering, but He tells us like it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now once again I have to pause and try to counter and undo some of the foolishness that goes around in the churches because people divide us up into compartments as people, right? And they say, well, you have a soul and you have a spirit and you have a mind and you have strength and you have a heart. And these are all different parts, compartments of you. And that's just silly. Um, uh, when, you know, one of the things you notice here is that Jesus is referring to these four things, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you were to go back and read Deuteronomy 6, as the footnote points you to do, um, which the Lord is quoting here, you'll see that there, there are only three. Um, so the point is not how many compartments are there and how we should view the human psyche and analyze it and divide it all up very neatly. The point is to say that we ought to love the Lord our God with 
everything, with all our energy, with all that is in us. That's the plain answer. It is the most important commandment. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater command, there is no command greater than these. Now some of the translations say the second is like it. Uh, they, they go hand in hand. You don't have the one without the other. They cannot be separated. You must love God above all, with everything. But, you must also love your neighbor as yourself. Now, nobody needs to teach you to love yourself. That comes naturally. That's normal. To love yourself, at least that is to say, to look after your own life, not to um, foolishly uh, kill yourself. You have a survival instinct. It's the way the Lord has hardwired us. We care for ourselves, we look after ourselves, um, there is a natural good love uh, of yourself. But yet, once again, we have to pause and undo the crazy teachings that are going around in the church. Because people, in, even in the churches, not merely in self-help manuals and ladies' magazines, uh, talk about self-image, but people in the church also talk all about self-image and how you must uh, view yourself and how you must love yourself and how you must, if you can't love yourself first, you're not going to be able to love those around you. Uh, and we've known uh, people abandon their children with that kind of thinking in their minds. I have to first look after myself. How can I even think about my children uh, until I've got myself right? It's nonsense. Right? So this, the, the Lord is not telling us here, first and foremost, you must love yourself. Okay? Now people are, would interpret this passage this way, and they use this passage to justify the um, uh, self-image kind of teaching that goes around. But it's, it's, it's bunk, and it's certainly not what the Lord is teaching here. You can't take modern day psychology and use that as the standard for what, to interpret what Christ was saying. No, no, his, mean, his words have a plain and simple forthright meaning, and that is simply to say that you must love your neighbor. You must love him very much. You must love him as much as yourself. Okay? Uh, th this, these words do counter the over. The excessive love of self that we we sometimes have, but it puts everyone on the par. You and your neighbor and your other neighbor all together. And he says you must love your neighbor as yourself. Is this not, after all, what the Ten Commandments are about? Loving God and loving your neighbor. The first and the second tables. Isn't this the way the Old Testament uh, teaches us again and again, line upon line, precept upon precept? It's not one without the other, it's both together. Right, I hope that brief explanation of what's going on here is clear enough. I don't think this is a difficult passage of Scripture to handle. Uh, the difficulty comes in applying it. To ourselves. And so let's endeavor to do that faithfully before God. The Lord has given us very clear instruction here, and we must hear Him. Do you understand from what the Lord has told you just how much you need Him? What am I referring to? I'm referring to Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah. 
who was a week away from the cross. And here, in the last of these questions, he teaches this poor man and his disciples and us. He teaches us about the most important commandment. But as you've read it now, I hope and trust and pray that your conscience has begun to work and that the Spirit has taken the Word of God and begun to work in your soul. Let me point your nose a little more in the right direction here, if you still are not quite clear on this. You need Christ. He has gone to the cross to die for your sins. Why do you need Him? Because you failed at precisely this point, right? If it is true that the greatest of all commands is to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, then it follows that the greatest sin is not to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. It follows that if you have withheld your love, your complete love, from God, then you have broken the most important commandment and you have committed the greatest sin. And you've not just done it once or twice on memorable occasions for which you've repented and asked forgiveness, but you've done it again and again and again and again. Who of you here can honestly say to God that you have loved Him with everything that's in you, with all of your energy, with your whole soul, with all your desire, and all your ambition, with all your intelligence, focused together in love to Him. And who of you can say that you've done that every single day, every single hour, every single day? minute. Do you see the point? Do you see how much you need your Savior? Because you've broken His law. And you've broken it at the most important point. Who is God? He is the Lord of all. He is your maker, and He is your covenant God. We have uh, the reference here to Israel. He is the covenant God of Israel. What does that mean? That means that He loves you. He has loved you without reserve. He's loved you absolutely. And He has loved you fully and completely, with no reservation, to the point of giving His own Son. He is our covenant God. What does He want in return? He wants the love of your poor heart. And this is how He wants it. In shame, our mouths are shut, our hearts are saddened and sorrowed, on account of how greatly we failed in this. What a travesty it is, we don't love Him. It's true that if you truly loved Him, you would keep all of His commandments, wouldn't you? The fact that you've broken all of his individual commandments is further proof that we don't really love him as we should. Now, once
once again, people dance around this in the church and say, well, yes, you can, it's true, we all know that. We know that we're sinners, but God has made a plan and God has sent His Son to save us from our sins and we are forgiven and we are delivered and we are children that live now under the grace of God. So it's all fixed up. And why are you preachers getting so worked up about the fact that the congregation and the Lord's people don't love God as they should? Hasn't Christ paid the price for that sin, even that sin, the vilest and the, and the worst of sins? Yes, He has. Of course He has. But, uh, They don't understand, you see, what Christ is also saying here. What is Christ saying? Look at his words. Hear, O Israel. Okay? So these are words to Israel, not simply indicating that they have broken God's law a thousand times, and severely. But also, these are words to Israel telling them what God wants of them. What is the greatest commandment? What is the thing that your Heavenly Father most of all wants from you? O Israel, O covenant child, He wants you to love Him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, all of your mind and your strength, and then also to love your neighbor as yourself. How do you match up on the second one, the second part, loving your neighbor as yourself? If you turn the spotlight on yourself there, can you honestly say that you have not put your own interest above the interest of others? Can you honestly say that you have loved and cared for your neighbor as much as you have for yourself? The truth is that very often our neighbor is right out of our minds. For day after day, week after week sometimes. And we don't much care for them. And we have therefore broken this part of the great commandment as well. Well, do you see that these words of Christ are very clear? Right? Not only are we on the spot, not only do we desperately need a Savior who will come and rescue us, and give us a heart to love the Lord, our Father, His Son, and the Spirit. He will. He will give you such a heart. That's His purpose. That's what He's going to do with you. He's going to make this true in you. That you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. This is also clearly the greatest command because it has always been there. Right? There's a saying, where there's no law, there's no sin. Okay, when when uh, um, drones first come out, there's no regulation. But when the drone is now used to spy on your neighbor, uh, now suddenly there's laws, right? But until that law came around, you hadn't broken any law and you were okay. But this one law has always been there. It was true for Adam, it was true for Abraham, it was true for Moses, it was true for David, it is true for the apostles, it is true for us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. It is required in all times and will be required into all eternity. It is the greatest commandment. Once again, we ought not to think 
that any other sins are greater. Some people think it's okay for me to be uh, to overindulge in alcohol because, uh, well, I'm not a murderer, and I've not cheated on my wife, uh, I'm not like any of them, you see, and the way that a man's mind works is he dances around his sins, and he regards some sins as much worse than the sins that he's committing. Uh, but we clearly learn here that murder is not the greatest sin, adultery is not the greatest sin, raping children is not the greatest sin, right? Wholesale corruption on a national scale is not the greatest sin. The millions of people killed by the regimes uh, that are responsible for the deaths uh, of such millions, that's not the greatest sin. Here is the greatest sin. Not loving God with all your heart. Now then, before we go, let's have another look at the teacher. Uh, the teacher of the law, the scribe, the lawyer. He recognizes and appreciates what Jesus has said. And he affirms the truth of it. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no one but Him. To love Him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to, know, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. So he takes it a step further and he's not wrong in that either. Okay, so he's, he's completely agreeing, I would suggest to you, with what the Lord has said. And he shows some understanding of, of what the Lord has said. He accepts his answer. He is teachable. Right? And that's most unusual for the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the like. So this man is, um, is, uh, is listening. Something is getting through to him. Right? And what does the Lord say to him? says these most encouraging words. You're not far from the kingdom of God. Now these are not condemning words. Oh, you're not far from the kingdom of God, but you're out. Um, no, no, these are encouraging words. Okay? He's inviting him to go further. He's inviting him to take the next step. You're not far from the kingdom of God. We must note that, you see, for ourselves. The little bit that we do know, we should take further. And the Lord would encourage you to do so. Okay, that's the kind of God He is. He's not one to put out a smoldering flax or to break a bruised reed. Rather, He encourages you and woos you, invites you to stand on your feet to come to him. Right? That's the next thing for this man, is to enter the kingdom. Come in. The door's open. We don't know if he ever did. But having said that, as encouraging as it is, and we must definitely take the Lord's encouragement from this, because we're often prone to, to missing out on the encouragement. Right? Let me just spell that out a little bit more. Uh, we're encouraged again and again to do what's right from the Scriptures. To seek first the Kingdom of the Lord. To serve Christ in commit, committed, faithful love. And so on. To be His good and loyal servants. To honor Him first in your life. And you've made some progress in that. You're far from perfect. You're far from getting it 100% right. But you've made some progress in that. The Lord encourages you. Don't rest on your laurels. Don't stop there. But more to go. You're not far away.
Right, but having said all these encouraging words, and may we take them to heart. Nevertheless, we are foolish if we think that it's okay to be near the kingdom. It's not okay just to be near the kingdom. Right? It's not okay to hover around but not go in. It's not okay to know all that we do know and yet not to be experiencing the joy of being in the kingdom of God, loving the Lord deeply and from your heart. You need to, you need to go through the door. As we heard this morning, it is come and welcome. You need to go in. And this man knew a lot. Right? He knew plenty. He could recite it here. And he could discern what was right and wrong. Discernment is not enough. Knowledge is not enough. Knowing all the stuff, knowing the ins and outs of the Christian faith is not enough. You must go in. Otherwise you're going to be like the people in Noah's day. Living right there within sight of the ark. Mocking Moses as they did. And then the rains came and the door was shut. And they were outside. Close. But a miss is as good as a mile. And so, that is true with you, that you're intrigued with the things of God. And you cannot, you find that, that, that the Lord has a grip on you, and you just cannot push Him out of your mind. And you're intrigued. Don't let it rest at that. You must close with Christ. Not far can be deadly close. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this lovely passage of the Scriptures. Thank you for your wise, holy, authoritative words that honoured your Father perfectly, that taught us so much in so few words. We pray that these things may be written deeply on our hearts and that we may with every single day of our remaining lives love you more and more. We thank you for the standard that you've set before us and your wish for us to achieve. And thank you that one day we shall by your grace achieve it in glory. And we yearn and long and hope for your work to be completed in us. In the meantime, may we not be disappointing sons, but may we be children uh, whose hearts belong to you more and more. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.